Our New Testament reading this morning is from Luke 12, verses 13 to 21. Although I may take pastor's privilege and go a little past that, we'll see. So someone from the crowd said to Jesus, Tell me, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said to him, Man, who appointed me as judge or referee between you and your brother? And then Jesus said to them, Watch out. Guard yourself against all kinds of greed. After all, one's life isn't determined by one's possessions, even when someone is very wealthy. And then he told them a parable. A certain rich man's land produced a bountiful crop, and he said to himself, Now what will I do? I have no place to store my harvest. And then he thought, I know, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. That's where I'll store all my grain and goods. And I'll say to myself, you have stored up plenty of goods, enough for several years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, fool, tonight you'll die. And now who will get the things that you have prepared for yourself? This is the way it will be for those who hoard things for themselves and aren't rich toward God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. There is more to life than food and more to the body than clothing. Consider the ravens. They never, neither plant nor harvest. They have no silo or barn, yet God feeds them. You're worth so much more than the birds. These are the words of God for the people of God. Well, I gave the name for our message today enough. Enough. Do you have enough? Do you have enough to retire or Are you retired? Will you have enough to last long enough? Do you have enough till the next check comes in the mail? And I know some of you, some of us, live in families that are really just one generation from the Great Depression where there was time when there wasn't enough. And that was handed down to us and and we lived knowing that there might not be and so if your family was like my family um, we understood that it would take careful planning budgeting living frugally and and that if we did that there there would be enough but we wouldn't have everything we wanted We knew that we would have to work, that we would have to work hard, that we would have to save for the future, that we would have to save for a rainy day, for an emergency, and save, 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 and definitely, definitely avoid debt. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems to me that as I watch the world around me, the expectation is awfully different. That I should be able to have all that I want. And that gets translated that what I want is what I need. You know, there's there's all the... You can't avoid the commercials. Wherever you go, it's commercials on TV or ads or whatever. And I know most of us will say, I'm not really affected by advertisement. Oh, but we are. Because advertisements aren't really selling a specific item or a specific thing. They're selling the idea that you need these things. It's that constant pick, 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 pick. And if you don't have something convincing you that you might need something like that. And I, I mean, how many times have I caught myself humming a tune like, hmm. You deserve a break today, so get up and get away. You know, I know I didn't sing that very well, but it gets stuck in your head and it becomes a part of our subconscious way of living these tunes and jingles that are designed to do exactly that. And then you add those, and on top of that, 
the ever-present hardcore selling of credit cards. I mean, how many in a week do you get in your mailbox? Do you know what they're selling? They're selling you debt. And there's those really nifty tear-jerker commercials. I mean, they're, they're wonderfully designed commercials that really tug at your heartstring, and then they end with, and for everything else, there's MasterCard. You see, and then, on top of that, I hear the, the, the commercial as I go down the road is, are you deep in debt and credit card debt? Don't let those evil credit card companies convince you that you have to pay it all back. We can sell you a program so you only have to pay half. Of course, then you have to pay the other two-thirds to them. But anyway, that's a different story. Proverbs, Proverbs 22 says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. We live in a culture, we live in a world that lives and believes that more is better. And I deserve what everyone else has. And of course, everyone doesn't have it. Doesn't have it all. Matter of fact, most of us who've been parents recognize, you know, our kids who've at one time or the other have said, but everyone's doing it everyone's going to be there. And as a parent, we know, no, not everyone has it. No, not everyone's going to be there. But sometimes that I deserve it gets twisted. Gets twisted in our minds and it's if I can't have it, then you can't have it either. Or that really pervasive, if I'm hurting, I want you to hurt just as much or more than me. See, because it's a zero-sum game. And what that means is that if you have, I can't. Or if I can't, you can't. Because there's not enough to go around. It's better if we both suffer than if one has good and the other one doesn't. And it's all over the news. It's all over our culture of the us versus them. And the yelling and the shouting gets louder and louder and louder and it spills out in outrage. I mean, how many, have you looked at, listened to the news lately and how many times in any given news thing the word outrage is used? And outrage periodically does explode into violence. Violence that captures our attention. Like El Paso or Dayton. And from the reactions around the country, there are thousands, if not millions, of people expressing outrage on all sides of almost any argument. And it's no wonder that some take it over the edge. Either pushed into their own nightmare of rage from what they don't have or what they perceive was taken away from them, or sometimes just plain evil that takes advantage of the chaos. But given how far and deep this outrage of the haves and have-nots has really gone, I mean, one of the things I wonder is, how come there's not more? How come there isn't more outbreak of these incidents of violence and of rage? What keeps the 99.999% of all people from ever going on a rampage. And I have to believe, at least in part, that it's God's grace that remains. I mean, in our Methodist tradition, we call that prevenient grace or preventing grace. That yes, we are all fallen. Yes, we are all incapable of righteousness on our own. Yes, we are all sinful. And yet, And yet, the image of God remains in us. God's prevenient grace that touches everyone to whisper, come to me. Come to me. Accept my free gift of salvation. Come to me. Let me change your heart to become what you were truly meant to be. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
But this cry of we don't have enough drives so much rage that we see played out every day. We don't have enough because somebody else has too much. Most important, they have what should be mine. And of all those things that people fight for, you know what? There's really only three things. Money, sex, and power. Stuff, relationships, and power. So at this point, you might be thinking, okay, so how in the world are you going to get from shootings in El Paso and Dayton to Jesus here in Luke chapter 12? Well, let me set the stage. Jesus was teaching lessons along the road as his disciples were following him and the crowds were gathering as they were on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. And as they were going, Jesus was teaching. He taught them the lessons that we've been looking at in Luke. He taught them about free at last. You can be free from your demons, from your habits, that you need to put Christ first You set those priorities appropriately that as a people of God we're sent to bring a a message of peace amongst all people. That there has to be a balance between what you believe in your heart and how you put that into action. That God is a generous God who wants to treat us like His beloved children. He's teaching those things along the way. And then... Even in the midst of that, he has encounters with people who are a lot more interested in tripping him up and catching him than they are in becoming his apprentices. There was a group that accused Jesus of being in league with Satan. Jesus called out those people who asked him for signs. He called them out when the truth was so plain right in front of their face. Jesus called out people who worked more on making themselves look good than with care for the change of their hearts. He showed up those attitudes that were more like that, that become a cancer amongst the people. And those same things that Jesus exposed were the same things that kind of infect even people who call themselves Christians today. Jesus was teaching about godliness, about following Him as Messiah and the glory to come. And some in the crowd got really wrapped up in that. And they got, it, it all sounds fantastic. Wonderful news. Those nasty people out there will get their comeuppance. I'm finally going to get what's ours. Jesus will finally give us what we want, what we need, our prosperity beyond belief. And you can still hear people preaching just like that every day on TV. But they were missing the point. And someone in the crowd actually bursts out and says, Jesus, tell that brother of mine to divide the inheritance with me. He doesn't even say, Jesus, tell him to share. He tells him, divide it. Give it to me. Even in the midst of Jesus, greed was growing as people followed him down the road. And there's something in this for me from a worldly perspective. And even those who were right there with Jesus, tell me what's mine. And Jesus says, watch out, guard yourself against all kinds of greed. Greed for money, for status, Us versus them. Or another way to say it is, don't fall into the trap of worshiping the gift over the giver. And of course, when that happens, that's called idolatry. Idolatry. How do you know? How do you know if you've fallen into that trap? Well, here it is. If there's something in your life to which you say or think, if I don't have, then life isn't worth living. If I don't have this possession, 
then life isn't worth living. If I don't have this kind of relationship, if I don't have this person in my life, then life isn't worth living. If I don't have power over others, if I don't have a job or career that I sought, life isn't worth living. If something runs through your mind and you hear in your own life, if I don't have one of those, life isn't worth living. You found your idol. You found your idol. And if you worship something other than God, you become other than image bearers that God meant you to be. Okay, so back to the story. Back to the story. So this man, this person who'd been following Jesus, seen what he had done, heard what he said, fell into the trap and said, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. So what do we do? Practically speaking, what do we do? I guess it probably would be helpful to look at the very next verse, verse 22, because there's a therefore. Since it's so easy to get tripped up like that, Jesus says, don't retreat into worry. He says, don't worry. I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, or what you'll wear. Who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? And then he talks about the raven, the birds, the lilies, the grass. Interesting, isn't it? That this demand, this guy demanded Jesus to get his brother to to divide up the inheritance. But Jesus, just a little bit earlier, just a chapter before, we talked about it last week, was teaching them to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Taught them that we have a Father in heaven who absolutely delights in giving his children what would be our daily bread. How quickly we forget. But you see, here's the thing. Not worrying is impossible. Not fixing those idols is impossible. You can't just stop. You can't. You have to put something else in its place. And Jesus said, build up your treasure in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added. Focus on being a disciple, an apprentice of Jesus. The cure for outrage is not getting what you want because wanting, craving what we can possess, relationships, power, it has no boundaries. It's a growing monster. There's never enough. The cure is putting something else in its place. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Well, how do we do that? It's actually really practical. It's the practices of being a follower, an apprentice to Jesus. What's an apprentice to Jesus? An apprentice is someone who says and breathes, I want to live my life as Jesus would live my life if he were me. Remember, not just it was just a little while ago that we talked about how something as innocent, not innocent, as you deserve a break today, can worm into your brain and get stuck in there. And then the question is, how do you get that changed to seek first the kingdom of God? Where, God, where what God wants is what actually happens. Well, it's to change the input. It's Scripture. Say, stay soaked in the Word. Psalm 119 says, Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against Thee. Or another way to say that is, Thy word have I hid in my heart so that it changes my entire worldview and I see it through a different lens. 
then when we've put that kind of input in through Scripture, then prayer comes out. If Scripture is the input, then prayer is the output. In prayer, we bring our worries, our needs before God that would otherwise fuel our outrage. Then an apprentice of Jesus also takes time apart. We might call that fasting. Taking time apart from everyday things and routines that helps us to zero in to focus our life with God might not be food that we fast from, that we take time apart from. It might be media. It might be TV. It might be any of those things that get in the way for you to seeking first the kingdom of God. Scripture, prayer, time apart, fellowship, and worship. Hanging out with others who also seek first the kingdom of God. It's more than just staying away from people who drag you away. We're not meant to be alone. We are meant to live in the kingdom of God, which is not a solo alone deal. It's the fellowship of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with all His people of every race, every gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, income level, all are welcome and to give. A generous heart because we have been given so much. It wasn't ours in the first place. God gave it to us. Our daily prayer is give us this day our daily bread. Give and giving is an outward acknowledgement that we have enough and because God is a giving God. I want to give you an example of how this works in action. Lal Rua lives in a tiny remote village in Mizoram. Her family sustains on a meager income of less than one dollar a day. Despite abject poverty, simple women like Lal Rua are spearheading a revolution that is sweeping the world of missions. Their movement, Bufai Thang, or a handful of rice. Bufai Thang is a practice where each Mizo family puts aside a handful of rice every time they cook a meal and later gather it and offered to the church. The church in turn sells the rice and generates income to support its work. Rice has been the staple food of the people of Mizoram. You are giving what is basic, essential, fundamental to your life. You are sharing that with God. <laughs> With the passage of time, people have given more than rice, vegetables, firewood, cereals, and their regular tithes, empowering the church to be self-sufficient. Mizoram state is the most backward state in India, and we are the poorest of the, of the poor, but still, we can raise funds for the ministry of the Lord. At the close of this last physical year, we receive altogether around 13 million US dollars. Out of that, 12% of our total income is from the handful of rice collection. With 1800 missionaries in India and many overseas, the Mizoram Church is known as a missionary church world over. This success is attributed to their selfless and creative giving. It is not our richness or our poverty that make us serve the Lord, but our willingness. So we Mizo people say, as long as we have something to eat every day, we have something to give to God every day. Bufai Tam. What would happen if even here in Fletcher, if we always gave a handful of rice? 
you know, what resources would be available to create new outreaches, new ministries, what outreach would happen when word got out about giving, about generous hearts. You see, you have enough. Enough stuff, enough power. Can you sing along with the Gaithers? I've learned to tell the difference between my wants and my needs. A good life now consists of just a few simple things. Jesus in my heart, a place to belong, a few good friends, and one good song. Oh, my latest list, it ain't that long. Just a godly love and one good song. Now we'll talk more about outrage in in a series coming up a little bit later and how we can be peacemakers in the midst of rage But for today, but for today, enough, enough. Let's pray. Father, You have given to us richly, richly more than we deserve. And it is enough, it is enough that You've given us Jesus, that You've given us life, that You've given life to us through His name, through His sacrifice, through His gift of His life for ours. O Lord, O Lord, that we in turn would rely and depend on You to give us this day our daily bread and to know that what You gave is enough and that in turn, we give back to You. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord, for Your teaching. Help us to put it into practice. For it's in Your name I pray. Amen.